seminary for the past two years. And uh, yeah, thank you for driving all the way down. Cool, we're gonna be here. All right, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we thank you for uh, bringing us together this afternoon. We thank you for the ministry and the, and the souls that you've entrusted to us and to these uh, young people here at this camp. We ask that uh, they always be good uh, witnesses uh, to love of you, and not only in their actions, Lord, but uh, in, inside each of their hearts, that, um, they, that you may always find true love there. Uh, and whatever is lacking in their minds and their hearts, uh, Lord, that you may provide for, um, for a way for a deeper communion with you, that they may truly know you uh, as, as, as God, as Savior, um, and uh, as intimate friend. We ask that our time to, uh, together be spent wisely and that it may work to build up your kingdom here on earth uh, and inside each one of us. Uh, we ask this as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great. There, uh, last time I was here was like maybe two or three years ago, and there were not, there were not as many of you. <laughs> It was not flowing out into the, <laughs> to the, to the hallways. So uh, either, either the room has gotten smaller or... <laughs> just kidding, they, they didn't shrink the room. They didn't. <laughs> wow, tough crowd, huh? <laughs> All right, so here's a, little, here's a little passage from Jeremiah. Uh, this is Jeremiah 31, uh, 33 to 34. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after these days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. For from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. So here, uh, spoken to the prophet Jeremiah, we hear, we hear of a great um, deep uh, desire or longing of God, right? God is longing for uh, to reign in the heart uh, of each one of us. To have this uh, intimate uh, knowledge uh, of us for him and uh, him of us. So that, um, I mean, he's being a little expressive that... No man will have to like teach another man, right? That um, we, we will all know the Lord. Now, obviously, we're not about to, to throw out, um, you know, education, um, the church's many different ways that she teaches and instructs. But we do want to, uh, you know, keep in mind that uh, all of that is, is for a, a reason, for a purpose. Uh, the great institutional, uh, the great institution of the church, uh, her teaching ways and uh, the catechism and uh, all these different things are in service to something greater. And that is for God to reign in your hearts, for, for us to really be, to be on fire for the Lord, to be uh, disciples of the Lord, to be like, and, and convinced that we are on mission. Uh, and so one of the one of the ways in which the church uh, in her in her in her wisdom does uh, does this is working through her saints right as examples through teachings we call them doctors of the church right they give us you know ways to to fall more in love with the Lord um, and uh, one of the things that the one saint in particular that the Holy Spirit has worked through uh, that has allowed people to come into a greater uh, intimacy with God, um, particularly around discernment, is uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola, whose feast day uh, was, was yesterday. Um, do you guys do like Saints of the Day and stuff here? Is that something that's... Uh... Yeah, Father, Father Ray like, talked about St. Ignatius history oh, nice. and homily and everything. So. Oh, cool. So, uh, obviously it's kind of fitting that we're here at... Uh, 
St. John uh, Francis Regis, because uh, what, what religious order was he, anybody? The Jesuit. The Jesuit, right, exactly. So St. Ignatius of Loyola founded the Jesuits. And, um, and um, so does anybody, you, maybe you've heard his conversion story of St. Ignatius of Loyola. It's, it's pretty, uh, uh, we'll do the G version, uh, the PG <laughs> version uh, uh, today. But he, uh, he was not, uh, he was kind of, um, grew up in kind of like an upper class. You know, he wasn't like the highest royalty or anything in Spain. They're like well off, uh, lower nobility, local nobility. And kind of a spoiled brat, uh, to be to be quite frank. He was uh, so maybe some of you can can relate, you know, uh, right? So um, um, yeah, and he grew up with a bunch of brothers, one, one one sister, maybe two sisters, and he just got a ton of trouble. Like he was real brass, he was arrogant, cocky, um, just thought the world of himself, uh, and he um, he didn't really have a lot of like respect for authority or other people. Uh, did not have a relationship with the Lord. He grew up, you know, uh, you know, Catholic was baptized and confirmed and everything. But um, all the men in his family, you know, wouldn't have didn't really even think about practicing their religion or considering what God maybe want, would want them to do in their life. They they did what they want. They tried to advance themselves, advance the family, advance the house, advance the name, uh, the family name, and he very much followed uh, along with this. Uh, it got so bad where he actually wrote uh, many different occasions for like over the process of three years. He wrote to the, the king of Spain uh, to get permission to, um, to, <laughs> to uh, that's freaking me out a little bit. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk over here. <laughs> Come on. Oh, you're in hope. This is so awkward. <laughs> um, so, um, so, I mean, I can just see, like, going back, right? We go talk to my priest, and it's like, there were so many kids listening to me talk. We were flowing out of the hallway. They were coming kneeling down at my feet. <laughs> this is the greatest talk ever, guys. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so um, he, uh, because he wanted permission to carry a sword, which would be the permission now to, like, carrying a concealed weapon, you know, like, uh, like a, a firearm, because this guy was trying to kill him. Um... Most likely because St. Ignatius had, uh, his wife had fallen in love with Ignatius or something, like something not good, right? So people are trying to kill him. Um, he you know, is, is, is kind of in the local militia things, his officer. And I, one thing I hate, and I, I hope I'm not doing this right now, is when people like glorify like this, you know, saints before they were saints and this. So, I don't want to do that with him. Like he's living a horrible life, so I don't want to glorify it in any way. You know, like, and, and I say that because it, it may sound kind of cool that he's like growing around doing all these things. He's got money and he's, you know, kind of a playboy and he's whatever. But I mean, there's people trying to kill him. You know, uh, he's in trouble with the law at different times. He um, he almost dies in battle, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because he's not because he's such a great warrior, but because he's so vain and he's prideful and he wants everybody to see that he's you know a great leader and all this stuff. Um, so that stuff like never works out, you know. He could have easily have died and gone to hell for all of eternity, you know, uh, with, with one one um, flip of the wrist, you know, if he was not keeping some guy's sword out of his throat, or if the cannonball would have been a little bit higher, a little bit to the left, he would have been dead. And we know that he was in a state of mortal sin, and um, we know God's mercy, so we won't kind of pr project exactly where we, we know what would happen to him, but it would not have been good. So we don't want to glorify his life before, but I say all these things because it kind of leads up to his conversion, which, which the Lord uses to give the church this great teaching on discernment. So what happens is he goes back to his home area in northern Spain, and they're being attacked by a kind of a, a county in France that, uh, you know, there weren't really countries uh, at, at the time, Spain and uh, France, like we know them to be now. And so he's defending the, the town, basically, 
and they're totally outnumbered by the French. The French have a bunch of cannons and things, and, and this, these, this, these guys are like, let's just, you know, surrender. He's like, no freaking way, excuse me, you know, are we surrendering? We are doing this, you know, like, we don't surrender. I mean, it's, it was basically pride, but so he leads this, he rallies the troops, and they keep fighting, they keep fighting, and the French are like, I can't believe these guys are still, you know, at it, and they shoot a cannonball, it ricochets off something, and takes out his, his knee, and, you know, debility. so once he falls, then they, they finally do um, surrender. He fought so val val valiantly that the French actually carried them back on their own stretchers to their doctor to set his leg. They were so like impressed by the way that the way this guy fought. Um, and the French doctor, right, set his or a surgeon, whatever, set his leg, his knee back. And then after some you know prisoner exchange or whatever, his dad kind of bought him out of prison. Um, released back to Spain. And so he's recovering in his home, kind of little castle thing there in Loyola. And the, the doctor's home, like, you know, the, your leg is going to always be like this little bump in it because the French surgeon didn't really quite set it right or maybe got jostled on the, the leader, you know, coming back. And he's like, no, it's not acceptable. <laughs> because the men, unfortunately, wore tights back then, you know, and that was like the fashion. Uh, don't laugh. It sounds I worry that we're going to go. We're going back to that direction, the way that some people dress in D.C. Guys dressing like girls again. But um, so so he's like, I can't. You know, I can't have this protrusion in my my knee. So he has the his doctors re-break his leg again to set it. And when they did it, he like didn't even winch. Like he just he was holding on to something, and he, they broke his leg. He's like, okay, <laughs> set it back, you know? <laughs> and then they, you know, they said, like, you can imagine what that was like. So um, long story short, he has this long months, right, in his bed of recovery. Uh, and the whole point is like, you don't move your leg or it'll get, you know, crooked again. And so um, he's, he asked for something to read. It was either his sister-in-law or, or his sister, um, but she told him, I don't know if this is, we don't know if this is true or not. The only thing that they had in the house was these books about the lives of the saints, like St. Dominic, St. Francis, and the life of Christ, right? That's the only thing that they said. Well, I can see my, uh, my sister doing that or my mom be like, oh, look, uh, these are the only books we could find. <laughs> like, we're rich. We have tons of books. Like, no, these are it. These are the only ones. So, and of course, you can't get up and walk around. So. So what happened over the next, I mean, the next couple of months, right? He had these couple books that he would read, and he would read them, and he would think to himself, "Well, what would happen if I do what Saint Dominic did? What would happen if I do what like Saint Francis did? What would happen if, if I?" He had this, he had this imagine imagination of traveling barefoot, fasting, eating just like herbs, all the way to Jerusalem. Like what? 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 What would that be like? Are we, we doing all right back there? What was that? Oh, that's good. I'm sure, somebody's a knife too. It'd probably keep him away. Um, maybe, maybe if you like didn't sit with your chair facing him, he'd leave you alone. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so as the story goes, right? Um, the, um, he starts asking himself, he has these imaginations, right? And he notices that when he's thinking about these like holy endeavors, that he, um, he's encouraged, he's enlightened, he's excited. He's like, his heart is lifted up. And that these things, these thoughts, these sentiments, they remain, even after he's done kind of thinking about that. And then he notices what happens when he has this other imagination, right? And we're all human and we all have uh, unholy imaginations and thoughts that run through our head and the nature's was no different and he'd had this one um one thought that in and of itself was not like sinful or immoral or impure but he thought to himself like what if i what if i were to win the hand of like a princess um or this a, a woman of great nobility and i won her hand through acts of chivalry and 
valor and all these things and we we did this and that and and that like that was his life and he noticed when he would think about these types of things afterwards while he well at the time he was excited and energized and it seemed great um but afterwards it left him wanting it left him kind of kind of empty kind of thinking about lower and, and base things and he, one day, he just realized the difference between these two actions, between these two thoughts, between these like, desires that were in his heart. And he says, on that day, his eyes were opened a little bit. And that changed the rest of his life. Because of that, because of that awareness that he had of the workings of these two different, we can call them spirits now, that were at work in him, he, he realized that the spirit that was causing him to have his imagination of going barefoot to Jerusalem and living a life of holiness and penance and of evangelization, that these thoughts were, remained and they was encouraged, etc., etc. And then when he, again, thought of the other ones, they was left base. When he realized what was going on, he realized that, oh my gosh, like, God is real. <laughs> God is real, and not every thought that comes into my head is from God. And I don't need to listen to every thought that comes into my head. Now, I want you to just like, we're just going to take a, just a minute here. And I just want you to think about the different thoughts that come in and out of, of your mind. Right? You can close your eyes, right? We can, you know, holding hands, but we can close your eyes. We can <laughs> just think. I mean, I did, on my way down here, Right when I wasn't praying the rosary or wasn't thinking my thought, my mind was like drifting in and out of like different things as I'm watching, like starting to see cornfields and you know things that y'all have down here in St. Mary's County, and um, I'm not in D.C. anymore, and this is great. And I started thinking about I was like, man, I started thinking about the emails that I haven't got back to. And particularly one of the priests that I haven't emailed, and he's like really squared away, and he like, seems to be always on top of things. He was here yesterday, <laughs> and uh, I was like, "Man, I have I've got to get back to him on these emails, right?" And so I started thinking about, um, which is which is a true statement. But then I I I like I went with it, and all of a sudden I was like, "Man, you are not a very good priest." You don't get back to people right away. And I was like, and then I started noticing that I was like getting a little like anxious and nervous. I was like, well, you know, not only having to get back to those, those two emails, but like I, I didn't return that phone call that one lady wants to do this. And I just started like thinking the thoughts changed to not just a thought, but like a, like a, like a, a, a mood kind of came over. And I was like, not excited, not energized. I was starting to doubt, kind of, not much my vocation, but like whether I was like, what, what, what do the other priests think of me? What do like the seminarians think of me? They must know that I'm not, you know? So do you, you see what was kind of happening? Is, is it, am I the only one? Is, is Ignatius and I the only two people that this happens to? No, I would, I would, I would best, like, at least of those of you who are like, um, you know, somewhat paying attention can, can, you know, can, <laughs> um, you know, th this type of things, like these things go through your mind, right? And, and Ignatius's whole point is that I, so without this teaching, the temptation for us could be, I have to like, think about all these things. Like maybe, Maybe I'm not a, uh, maybe they all do think I'm not a good priest. Maybe I have to like change everything. Maybe I have to do this or do that. Or, you know, maybe I'm not who I think I am, right? Or, or I mean, this is, I don't know why I picked this example, but um, so we are sometimes held captive by thoughts and feelings and desires. Um, anybody can think of a, a, another example that maybe I got a more apt to you guys? It doesn't have to be a personal one, or it could be a personal one, where you've kind of been 
almost in, enslaved or like trapped by, by a thought or a feeling. Anybody? Yeah, it's kind of like a, yeah. I guess like just overall like um, always being like conscious of like how other people perceive you. Yeah. And, like you're always just conscious of like. Yeah. And what, runs your, what's that like? Huh? What's that like when you're always kind of worried or thinking about? Uh, you start. You end up living like not not really your life. You start uh, living like what you want them to see. So yeah. You, like they kind of dictate for you. Right. It's not really even them. It's like this, this idea that, right, that you have to do. So, uh, I mean, if I were to go to the other priest and be like, hey, you guys think I'm a good priest? Uh, I'm 99% sure they'd be like, uh, yeah, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, if I asked the seminarians, I think maybe in general, I know Kyle may disagree, but I think most of them for the most part would, would, would probably say that, I, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good priest, you know? Um, right, so it's not even really them. It's this, and that is one of the marks of the enemy, is that it is a non-reality, right? That's what Ignatius notices. He is of a local, a minor nobility. Could he ever marry a princess? If anybody knows their Spanish history of 16th century. Is it possible? No. Impossible. Could not happen. Could not happen, right? If maybe if all of the nobi male nobilities died, maybe. <laughs> but like, so it's so it's something that this this the spirit begins in non-reality for Ignatius, right? And these thoughts and these things, and so the enemy is, is works in fantasy and non-reality. You know, take things that, that are partially true or partially good and twist them and turn them to the, the non-reality. Is the uh, uh, example that was given, right? Is that the enemy proposes, you know. To, wants to dictate to you how you live your life based off a perception of what others may think or do or whatever, which is usually totally wrong. And so what the spear is uh, trying to get to is something, you know, very much at, at, at the core. Because eventually, where is the evil spear of the enemy? Where is it ultimately trying to lead us? No. Yeah, right? So, um, so it's going to do that in, in all these different ways. Uh, so, uh, so the thing is, right, is that what happens for Ignatius in this moment is he realizes, oh, so, oh my gosh, like, not all these things, I, I don't, so there was a great freedom. He's like, I don't have to listen to these things. So he has, is now empowered with a freedom to reject thoughts that are not from God. Because he begins to know and believe that the thoughts that are not from God are from, you know, the enemy, the spirit of the world, uh, uh, minor demons, like wh wh however you want to describe that. But they all have their own, the same destination, which is not heaven, it's hell. Um, so this is a really, really liberating thing for us to understand, right? Because we too can get trapped in our minds. We can get trapped in our feelings in our thoughts, and even in desires. And, and sometimes we feel, you know, we're captive. Like we, well, because the feeling will say, you're not going to be happy if you don't own this, right? If you ask someone who's like a shopaholic or something, right? A hoarder or whatever. Uh, people are looking at each other. <laughs> He's talking about you. <laughs> not talking about anybody particularly. But, um, right, we, right the, the, the spirit will say, you're not going to be happy unless you have that. Or another thing, like you won't be happy unless people think of you this way. You won't be happy unless you make this team or you get this grade or whatever the case may be. And so we want to discern that spirit, that feeling, that thought, or that desire. Because if it is not from God, it will never make you happy. It'll have that initial, I mean, just like if you you know, like get drunk or you do drugs or you, you know, have in impure actions and things, there will always be that, like that rush or that good feeling, but every single time it will leave you wanting, depressed, sad, etc., a little bit closer uh, to the enemy, a little bit further away from God. Um, so we want to test, we want to discern these, these feelings, these thoughts, these desires when they come. And we, we, so, we, so we can live in, in freedom. Um, and this is like, you know, really the beauty 
of what a nation does. This is what uh, the Lord prophesizes through the prophet Ezekiel when he, when, uh, you know, beginning with the, uh, the, the passage that, that I read. So uh, I know I'm, I'm just about out of time. We end at 1.30, is that right? Yeah. So um, here's three, three quick steps, right, of how we can discern these things. These three steps are not for, like, what flavor ice cream you want. Um, they're not for, um, you know, these little things. These are, these three steps are for the important things uh, of your life. We would call it things that affect you on a spiritual level, right? The steps are be aware, understand, take action. So what does Ignatius do? He's in bed, in his convalescent bed. The thoughts, now that this has happened, when the thoughts come of courting this princess and winning her hand, he is becomes aware of it. He's aware of what is going on in his heart. A lot of us are not aware because what we do is we just look at the phone or we just turn on the radio, we turn on the TV, or we just pick up the phone and we talk to somebody. As soon as something slightly uncomfortable comes up, we just distract ourselves, right? It's a, so we want to be aware of what is going on in your heart. Be aware of what desires or what thoughts or what feelings are going on and admit that to yourself. It's not a sin to feel or to think or to desire something. It's a sin or not as to whether you act on it or entertain it or whatever the case may be. So we need to be aware. We need to keep our spiritual eyes open. That's why we have time for prayer, even if it's just a few minutes at the end of a busy day. Time in the car, time before you go to bed, where you are taking time and you're doing um, you're this. You're, you're being aware. You take into account. Then we want to understand, right? So in Ignatius' case, the thoughts about this, you know, errantry and winning this hand this, this prince's hand or whatever he's like okay here these uh, these thoughts are real like I, I want to do these things but i now know that they're from the enemy right because they don't leave me uplifted and you know these types of things encouraged you know desire to do the good etc so we want to understand where the things are coming from right so we want to stop before we hit click on the eBay buy button, right? Or the, you know, click on a website or just we hit, you know, send on the text or we ask somebody to tell us a little gossip, whatever we're going to do to, you know, we want to stop. We want to understand what spirit is at work. So we are aware that the spirits are at work on us. We understand whether they're from God or from the enemy. And the last step is to take action, right? To accept or reject. So now, when Ignatius is in his bed and these thoughts come, what do you think he does when these thoughts of winning a princess's hand? Um, ignores them. You're right. He, he rejects them. You can do it a hundred different ways, right? In the name of Jesus, I reject the spirit of lust. I reject the spirit of fantasy. I reject the spirit of whatever. You know? You just run to Jesus, whatever you want to do. Um, and this takes him getting used to, you know? I mean, how many times are you... Or did you just let your mind escape into an impure thought or um, some flight of fancy? Or, it doesn't mean you can't daydream. You know, like daydreams can be can be good. You know, we just have to notice how how it leaves us when it when it when it's when it when it's gone. Right. So then, when when the idea or the thought of of doing something great for God comes to Ignatius, what would he do? Like listen and think about it. Accept it exactly. So you you, you accept the things that are from God. So maybe, um, you know, I, I, I leave here and I just remember something that I, that, that, that I saw, you know, that it just, it was really good or beautiful about this camp. And I just noticed something stirring inside. Like I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful or I'm encouraged. There's like this many kids listening for the most part to my talk, right? <laughs> like, I, should I accept that or reject that? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Thank you, Lord. Like that was awesome. Like these kids, this, I was really encouraged to see this many kids, like at this camp, you know, kind of into this. This many kids at adoration, whatever the case may be, right? So I accept that, and I and I and I, I'm grateful for it. And um, really, really basic things. We, the whole point is to not be held captive by thoughts, feelings, or desires. To understand that there is a spiritual warfare going on. There is somebody working behind these things. The good to accept and the bad to reject. 
I think I'm out of time. <laughs> so that's all. Awesome. Okay, yeah, we'll any, any quick questions or comments or, or anything um, like that?